Frailty and sarcopenia. These are terms that are becoming increasingly used in geriatric medicine in particular, and are conditions that are becoming more and more prevalent as the population ages. Along with multimorbidity, you could potentially see them as the main issues created by the ageing process. As such, they're clearly something you need to know about. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an introduction to them. So, frailty. What is it? If we start simple, this is a definition that I particularly like. Multi-system impairment associated with increased vulnerability to stressors. Why do I like it? It's simple. It's something that's easily understandable and memorable, but also it really does, for me, cover the essence of frailty. Let's break it down a little. Multi-system impairment. What's that saying? It's simply saying problems with more than one system. It doesn't necessarily mean any one system's completely broken, just more than one isn't perfect. If you look at the basic epidemiology of ageing, we can clearly see the number of major conditions that people have increases with age, and that people are living longer with more problems, but that's for another lecture to explore. So on to the second part, increased vulnerability to stressors. If you stress or strain, damage or impair these systems, things are more likely to go wrong. These systems are fragile. They have less reserve. You could look at it as being like a game of Jenga towards the end. You might get away with removing a piece, but if you push or pull too hard, or it's just the wrong piece. So there we are. Frailty. Multi-system impairment associated with increased vulnerability to stressors. That's it. So how do we recognise people who are frail? Let's start simple. There's a school of thought that says simply that geriatricians know it when they see it. And this is actually something I kind of agree with, but it's certainly not something that's helpful to many non-geriatric specialists. So what is it that we're actually seeing? People have looked into it in different ways, and one rather nice basic idea is that of the cumulative deficit model that basically says that the more problems you have, the worse your long-term prognosis is. Again, not clever or complicated, and frankly pretty obvious. But the problem is, this model looks at almost a hundred different areas. Nobody can do that in real life, and it's certainly not something that can be done at the front door. A potentially more usable idea is the phenotype model, or what someone basically appears to be like, which looks at weight loss, lethargy, slow gait speed, weak grip and reduced activity. Three or more are classed as being frail. I'm just going to highlight two parts here, slow gait speed and weak grip. We'll come back to them in a minute. Before moving on to treating frailty, I'm going to quickly look at sarcopenia because it's hugely relevant to frailty. So what is it? Basically, it's loss of muscle mass or function. People have looked at how to diagnose it, and in 2010, a basic diagnostic algorithm was created, which you can see here. All this really looks at is walking speed, grip strength, and muscle mass. You don't need to remember this diagram, but notice two of these areas, the two easiest to assess, gait speed and grip strength. It's not a coincidence that those are two of the five areas in the previous frailty definition. Some loss of muscle bulk and power is normal with ageing. We all know a 20 year old is going to be a faster runner than the same person aged 60. But there's normal loss with ageing and abnormal loss with ageing. But just as importantly, there's acute loss over days and weeks and less acute, more long term loss over months or years. I'm interested in both, but the one I think you should be particularly interested in is the more rapid onset. If we look outside of medicine at astronauts, they go to space in peak physical condition. But in space, there's no gravity and moving around takes almost no strength. We commonly see pictures of astronauts using fancy gym equipment in space. Indeed, they spend hours a day using it, but still, when they come down to Earth, their muscle mass is greatly reduced. A few hours in the gym 
can't offset the complete lack of use the rest of the day. Muscles simple, use it or lose it. The fancy term for this is disuse atrophy. Our patients don't know they're going to get sick. Unlike astronauts, they don't prepare for their acute stress event. They don't build up a reserve in the gym beforehand. And then, regardless of what they've come into hospital with, we invariably tuck them up in bed. And they do exactly what we'd expect them to do. They rapidly lose muscle strength and power. And then we try to get them up a week later and are surprised they can't. I've worked in hospital for almost 10 years now. and I've never seen anyone really exercising in hospital. They may walk up and down a corridor with a therapist for 10 minutes, but more than that, never. Should we change? Undoubtedly. Are we going to? I'll leave that for you to consider. So what do you need to be aware of here? Hospitals aren't good for you. Sarcopenia is by no means the only reason for this, but it's one of them. Now, let's be a little bit clever. This is a cycle of frailty, and it's almost 20 years old. Again, not something to learn, but probably something to pause and look at for a minute or two. Look how interrelated everything is. Can you see that Jenga tower building up and up? There's only one thing I really want to draw your attention to here, the bottom right hand corner. Sarcopenia also leads to VO2 max reduction, or in simple terms, the lungs are powered by a muscle too. There's huge consequences of this for both day-to-day -day activity, but also in considering further management of people with acute respiratory failure. That's way outside the scope of this lecture, but something to consider. Finally, treatment of frailty and sarcopenia. Unfortunately, there's no magic pill here. There's not even a combination of pills that work well at reversing this process. So what can we do? A number of years ago, the idea of the comprehensive geriatric assessment was invented. In basic terms, this says, look at everything and optimise everything as much as you can. But what is everything? It's things like making sure they're being treated for every condition they have, but balancing the side effects of treatments for one thing against another. It's therapy assessment and exercise programme consideration. It's nutrition review. It's looking at things like the home environment for hazards. It's assessing vision. It's assessing toileting needs. It's assessing their cognitive function and social situation, including things like care requirements, but also social networks. In short, as I said earlier, it's looking at everything and optimising everything. It's not something that needs to be done in hospital, although we as geriatricians do it. It can also be done in the community by many different people. But if we don't have the information, we miss things. Do we know the patient's home is a mess? No. Do we know the patient lives off a tea and toast diet at home? No. Do we know they don't take the yellow pill on a Tuesday or the pink one on a Friday or the white one at all just because? No. Would we like to? Undoubtedly, these things matter. So there we are. We know what frailty is, multi-system impairment associated with increased vulnerability to stressors, and we know what sarcopenia is, loss of muscle mass or function. And finally, we know how to treat it, comprehensive assessment.